Lumio is excited to sponsor this uh, webinar. We are an award-winning digital learning tool that will help transform your lessons into active collaborative learning experiences. And I'm very excited to have three educators who work with teachers and students daily, um, sharing some ways that teachers can save time and engage students while encouraging student autonomy. Um, I, I know Jonathan and Bethany, and um, I have been a longtime follower of Vicki um, back in my classroom days, so this is a, a treat for me. Um, so our host today, Vicki uh, Davis, is a 21-year teacher and blogger, also known as Cool Cat Teacher. She's in the classroom every day and uses Lumia with her computer science students, which is awesome, and will help facilitate today's conversation. Um, and joining Vicki, we have two of our Lumio ambassadors, Jonathan and Bethany. Super excited to have you guys here. Um, I always learn a lot um, from the two of you, um, and I think you will as well. Uh, before we begin, I just want to remind you that um, Lumio is free, so you can sign up today. Uh, so let's let, have the webinar begin. Over to you, Vicki. Yes, we're so excited to be here. Um, the goal of today is to be very, very practical and to give you lots of ideas. Um, if you are here, I believe you will save time today um, and have lots of ideas for how to help uh, teachers and um do lots of really cool things. Here we go. We're going to start off by introducing Jonathan. He is an educator for over 12 years. He's taught 7th, 8th, 10th English, as well as 9th through 12th grade broadcasting. Love that, Jonathan. I teach broadcasting also. His fourth year serving as a K through 12 technology integration coach for Warwick School District uh, in Pennsylvania. And he uh, really loves to engage learners. And when you see some of the pictures of the classrooms that he works with, People get really excited in your classrooms, don't they, Jonathan? I'd like to think we have a good time, yeah. Yeah, and, and Lumio okay. is a big part of that, so we will uh, share that. And we also have uh, Bethany Valio. She's an instructional technology coach for the Bibb County School District, or right up the road from me, not too far. More than 16 years of experience in education. She was an educator in the Bibb County School District for 11 years, and now she's in instructional technology at the uh, district level and works with personalized learning and um, so many other exciting things. And so, Bethany, you just love reaching all the kids with awesome tools, don't you? I do. I do. K through 12. So she will have stories from all the different uh, classrooms. We've already introduced to me. I was in the classroom just a, about an hour and a half ago, jumped in the car, and we're getting ready to talk. So again, thank you, Lumio, for sponsoring today. So first of all, we're going to give a little bit of a description of Lumio. So Jonathan, how would you describe Lumio? You know, when you talk to teachers the first time, how do you explain what it does? Yeah. So um, Vicki, I'm just glad that we could be here tonight and just kind of have a practical conversation, uh, you know, because this is, this is really what it's about. You know, all of us are in the classroom and Lumio is something that uh, when I introduced to my teachers uh, a few years ago, mo most of them were familiar with um, Smart Notebook at the time. Uh, and when my tech coach partner and I came across Lumio and all the advancements that it made, uh, it was pretty game changing as far as the level of um, interactive uh, uh, you know, resources that were basically available to it. Um, we, we kind of really dove into it uh, at the start of COVID when we needed to go remote and when we were partially hybrid. So that was my selling point with my teachers was we finally found a tool that we can use for our in-person students as well as our remote students. Uh, and then even now, as we're kind of back full time, uh, we realize that all of those uh, little bits and pieces in Lumio uh, still work really well for differentiation in the classroom, really support the four C's for um, collaboration and creating and communication uh, among our students. Yeah, and whether you're sharing a worksheet or you want an interactive manipulative, it's all there. So, uh, Bethany, how do you describe Lumio to your teachers? To me, it's really that one um, tool that's that one-stop shop for everything that you need for teaching and integrating content in the classroom. Um, it just encompasses so much, and that's the way I draw a lot of teachers in, to sell them it's that one tool that you need, um, and it has everything in that toolbox. It does. Uh, and it's very, very practical. So we have 11 reasons that uh, that we love Lumio. I'll inject some of my own personal experiences as well. But um, Jonathan, you're going to talk about how easy it is to build lessons, first of all. 
Yeah, so uh, everyone should be aware that 11 was kind of hard to to take it down to that number because I think <laughs> our list was substantially uh, greater at first. But uh, these are our our top 11. But trust me, there's more. And I think you know you asked about like you know how did we how do we talk to teachers about this? This is probably the first part because we all know being in the classroom, uh, you have a thousand tasks every day between grading, between lesson planning, between IEP meetings, and speaking with parents and things like that. So. One thing we didn't want to provide our teachers was more work. And honestly, uh, the ease of, of creation in Lumio uh, was one of our biggest selling points with teachers because, you know, it's essentially you can make things on the fly. You can make things in, in very limited time. You can take what you already have and turn them into uh, interactive resources. So uh, the picture that you see, you know, up front here with that, that little smart uh, icon, I did I did a demo uh, when, when I was uh, presenting with the uh, Luminate Global Conference. And this is a demo that we provided for our, our staff during some professional development. But ultimately, this is a Google slide, what you're looking at. Um, and by simply importing this into Lumio, uh, you can suddenly turn this into an interactive. So just taking that little like star image there, uh, turning on infinite cloner, uh, and then we turned this into an exit ticket. So every teacher that was in our PD session could grab that star and drag it to one of their favorite um, favorite, you know, tools that is pretty much in Lumio. Uh, and we made an exit ticket in about 20 seconds. So there are just so many ways that you can create lessons. We could probably spend the whole hour just talking about that. But ultimately, uh, the, the interface is so friendly. There's pre-made things. You can import anything. Uh, just super easy to build. You know, and, and I do want to add that, you know, when I saw it, I could pull in the PDFs I'd already made, my study guides and, and all that sort of thing as I'm reviewing for exams and see how, as the kids are working on the study guides, see it live and give feedback. Uh, just the ability to pull in PDFs is just uh, awesome as well as everything else. Well, um, and, you know, I, I just mentioned there that infinite cloner piece and even something for, you know, we just a week ago, we we're working with uh, kindergarten and first grade classes that had these little handouts that had, you know, different letters that students were trying to spell words. And just by taking the alphabet and putting it there and making them infinitely cloned, students now have a, an infinite whiteboard where they can create words. So like just so many ready to go, easy ways to build these. Excellent. Bethany. Yes, so one of my biggest things that we're working with in our district is getting students to think about what they're learning and self-reflecting and seeing where they're at really at their learning and really taking that learning target success criteria, turning that into a, a goal for them to accomplish um, as they go through the unit or the content. And I, my biggest, like I love these pre-made templates for questioning, reflection, um, the one down here at the bottom in the right-hand corner is my ultimate favorite tool to use. Um, just because the emojis are already, already put in there for you, the question is already put in there, the answers, and I can just do it right there on the fly and talk to the kids and say, okay, where are you at in your learning today? Are you, I got it, I'm good, I'm ready to go. Or um, I need a little bit more work. Can you pull me into a small group setting? And then the last one is, you know, mm, I don't have this at all. I need some more practice. I need a lot of extra help. And so it really gives that really good judgment to automatically group my kids and prep them for what they need next. And so you can just pull these in and add them to your lessons that you have already and just pull these uh, templates. And Oliver's asked a great question. Um, I love shout it out. What's everyone's favorite Lumio feature? We're going to get to those. And I challenge you, Jonathan and Bethany, to make sure you mention those. And uh, I'm going to suggest to uh, Casey that that was a great question, huh? I think it's a great question, y'all. You think we need to give away our first Lumio prize here? Uh, let's go ahead and talk about a number two, which is a massively useful manipulatives. So again, you know, like I know um, Jonathan was talking earlier about like the pandemic and like kids not having those manipulatives to take home, but still sometimes in the classroom, it's, um, you know, like I lose pieces. If you've ever taught K through two, um, it is very hard to keep up with chips in your classroom or base in blocks. They usually end up on the floor or and you're under, they're under the table picking them up. Or if you're doing making words with little letter tiles, the kids, you know, it's just cutting the paper out. Um, those are great, like tactile activities, but to have them digital and like to be able to change it up, to have a balance of like tech tools as well as paper and pencil is fantastic. 
So I love that these pre-made base 10 blocks are already done. Kids can come up with equations. You can see in the bottom right-hand corner, um, one of the students we were working with, he was coming up in third grade, he was coming up with multiplication facts. And he was using the counters on the hundred chart to go through and actually count, but you know, to solve multiplication problems. So I love that that was built in right there, um, really personal, personalizing his instruction. And then again, making the words, and I love that one. It's one of my favorites with the manipulatives piece because kids, you know, like they're blending words, they're sounding out words. And that's such a big thing happening in like reading, um, science of reading right now and like getting kids to be able to do that and making that an individual handout is so powerful because everybody has their own copy and they're able to move through those. That's awesome. And Tim says his favorite Lumio feature is the ability to instantly choose to make a slide, an individual handout, small group activity, or whole group activity, and that you could do that so very easily. Um, and, you know, another thing that I just want to mention is um, those of you who have had the classes about how to use manipulatives, math manipulatives, they're awesome classes, but you do end up with those pieces all over your classroom. And so this is a way to pull in the math manipulatives uh, all the time without the mess and you've yes. still got that which is really cool okay so uh bethany you're up again effective instant feedback and formative assessment so to me feedback is so powerful but a lot of times as a teacher what would be happening you know we get their papers and we would be grading it right or you would have to like i remember going around like with a stamp and i would have to go stamp everybody's paper or give them a check with this, I can have my computer in my hand and walk, uh, walk around my classroom and see everybody's screen all at one time and go through and give them a smiley face emoji icon, uh, emoji and icon and then or give them a check or give them that feedback and say, hey, go back and check this piece um, of your work. Try this again. And it's not, you know, I love the part too. It doesn't really call the student out because they're the one that sees that feedback and nobody else does. So nobody knows if they got something wrong or if they got it incorrect or anything like that. Um, you're still building that self-esteem with that student and they're able to see what they're working on all the time in real time. Which is just fantastic. And that, that privacy and Jonathan, you wanted to add some too. Yeah, I just think that immediate feedback is so important for, for our learners. Um, it doesn't have to be tied to a grade. It doesn't have to be, you know, something final, but this is how we get to, you know, our final goals and objectives when we're learning. Uh, I think I learned pretty early on in my career as an English teacher that if I assigned a student a rough draft and a final copy of a paper and didn't give them feedback until they, they got the final copy back, that was pretty useless because it would usually be a quick look at the grade and then write in the trash. Um, so even in our writing process, using Lumio uh, as a way that, you know, getting eyes on everybody's screens at once as they're going through that process, having them immediately get uh, feedback from their peers, um, that was just so powerful. And, and, you know, you can just see in some of the screenshots on this, uh, we're looking at more uh, primary here, uh, and maybe like K to K to four, K to three, um, K to two, but uh, I'm seeing that, you know, these are some images that we have from being in the classroom doing handouts, and being able to immediately look at a student's rainbow edition or their spelling and to like instantaneously just say, hey, you're on the right track, keep going, or hold on, let's pause, let, let's take a look back. And then the game-based, uh, all of the games that are included in Lumio there, those game-based activities, they provide the students feedback without the teacher having to even interfere. So it's no penalty if you get it wrong, but you can see, oh, I didn't do that right, let me try that again. Really effective. Okay, so here's a question. Uh, Bobby Brian Lewis, um, can you run Lumio on your cell phone or iPad? Now I've had kids run it on multiple things because it's web-based. So what, what do you guys know about that? Absolutely on iPad. We are K to two students, uh, our iPads, and then we are on uh, MacBooks for our three to three to 12, but we've used it in both K to two classes on iPads. Students still go to uh, hello smart. I don't know if that's still the uh, exact one with the code and it works just as well on iPads. Yeah. It is. It's fantastic. Um, and the students love it and they get right into it and it remembers them. I love that piece too. So it's not something they have to continuously remember or sign into. They just select their teacher and go right on in. That's a great point, Bethany, too. Yeah, the fact that after they're in once, it, it remembers that they're in that classroom is huge, especially for the littles. Yes. So we want to talk for just a moment about formative assessment. Now, um, 
you know, I've been using EdTech for a while. I know you guys have as well. And um, I think formative assessment is, is the big thing technology has started to allow us to do in the very recent times, you know, the last three, four or five years. And, and that formative assessment is there uh, inside Lumio where you're given that constant feedback and as knowledge is forming, you're adjusting your instruction, that sort of thing. But um, let's talk for a minute about what makes good formative assessment and have you seen teachers maybe misapply formative assessment, call it formative, and it's really not. Who wants to take that one first? I can jump in if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I mean, what makes an effective formative assessment? You know, I think the first thing is that it, it, it should provide feedback that's meaningful and it should be immediate. Um, again, it doesn't, it's not tied to a grade. Uh, I think that um, we're, we're really, you know, when we look, talk about formative assessment, we're, we're trying to work toward a learning objective. So these should be sprinkled in throughout everything, you know, they, they should be constant. Um, and just seeing uh, one of the slides that I had in the presentation before, as far as, you know, that concept of engagement, I think good formative assessments lead to student engagement. Uh, you know, they do keep students connected because they're constantly reinforced and being told either, hey, you're on the right track or oh, let's let's back it up. And when students feel confident and when students are building on those skills and they're feeling like, I'm not just guessing, am I doing this right? Then they're more motivated to continue on to whatever that lesson objective is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just think we need it all the time. And I, yeah. I would encourage teachers that, you know, constant, you know, provide constant feedback. Right. Bethany, do you have any thoughts? Yes. Um, so to me, I think it, it like gear, you're like guiding them. You're being that Yoda. You're being that guide on the side per se to really and say, okay, uh, let me steer you back on track, you know, and like, so you don't veer off and go to the left. Um, so it's really important to have those formative assessments and making sure you're making that connection with the students to keep them on the right, right track of getting that standard, just being that guide on the side and formative assessments help us to be Yoda. Yes. And, you know, I think the big thing is just because something gives you a number doesn't mean you have to put it in the grade book. You know, right. uh, when, when knowledge is forming, the knowledge is forming and you need to allow that knowledge to form and you need to give them that feedback so that they master. And then when you have that mastery, then you're assessing and, and you move them along that chart. So um, I have seen a question where Janet has said, um, my students do not have one-to-one -one devices. So there is an answer for that. I think we're about to get to that. Uh, Janet, I have right after game-based learning. So we're going to address that. Um, and that'll be wonderful. So let's talk about the fun game-based learning. And we're going to actually break this down by grade level, because I know somebody earlier said, Hey, I want more ideas for kindergarten. So we're going to go all the way through the grade level. So Bethany, let's start with you. Yes. So working with kindergartners, you'll see in this picture, um, we had a student and he was, um, they were struggling with letter sounds um, phonemic awareness. And so these labs, um, I'm used to calling them smart labs, were already created and the teacher was able to pull those in and like automatically give it to that kid. And the kid started going through and matching the letter with the um, pictures of the sound. And the beautiful part that I love about this is so many kids are used from K to 12 are used to playing video games, right? And so they have that mindset to go in there and play these games. And if I get it wrong, it's okay. I've that growth mindset comes in play here. And you sometimes you see it in the classroom, but you really see it when they're playing these game-based games like this, because even though they get it wrong, they're not like, I'm giving up I, that fixed mindset where I can't do it anymore. They automatically have it within them, that motivation, that intrinsic to start over again, right? And to really, 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 really say, okay, I can do this. And they keep doing it until they get it right. And so they build that foundation and these games just play into that. And that's one of the reasons why I love them. Okay, so we're going to talk a, a little bit more K to two. Jonathan, give us one of your favorite K to twos. Yeah, I mean, Bethany hit the nail on the head with, uh, you know, all of her points that she made there. One one thing I, you know, just add to it is, and, you know, we see an example here. This is base 10 blocks, uh, which, you know, my daughter's come home with worksheets before with these where she's had to circle them. But this is, again, one of these opportunities where you can play it over and over and over until you get it. And, you know, the, the one point I would just add to, to any of these is, you know, 
being in tech, I feel like I've seen plenty of other uh, academic websites and game-based websites. My daughter's in second grade. She'll come home and say, you know, hey, I've played, I won't, I won't mention any specific websites, but I was like, what do you learn in those? Because they're pretty much like, there's not really anything academic in them. And, and the nice thing about a lot of these templates, a lot of these game-based activities, they really do focus on the content. Uh, so even K-2, whether we're talking base 10 blocks, we do a lot of things with phonics and with, with words and with letters of K-2. Uh, and there's so many, you know, the manipulatives, there's even like a, you know, there's a money counting manipulative, things like that. But it, it, it totally focuses in on the content and it makes it valuable for the students. It's not just a game to play a game. Excellent. Okay. And then you can actually go back and, and look back at the reports and see what they do after, because, you know, that's the other thing is when you're right in the middle of teaching, sometimes you don't have time to look at that individual data, but you can come back and look at the data afterwards, right? Yes, definitely. Okay. Um, let's look at three to five. Yeah. Just going and looking and, and just touching on that data piece right there. So the bottom two and um, the one right there, the little flower one is the, those right now are like my favorites just because you can model for the students how to do it, but you've got that dashboard that you can pull automatically to see, okay, here's where this student is, how many they're getting right, how many they're getting wrong, and like bringing that piece in for them. And y'all, kids of all ages, it's not just K through two, uh, K through two, three through five love these games just as much. Um, a lot of them like the monster quiz. That's one of their favorites in the game show. And so it just really engages them and gets them on track with their learning. And they're like, oh, can we do another one? But my favorite part of this when we're playing the game is if I stop it and like go to another slide in the middle of my lesson, they're like, oh, you know, and so it total, they're like, what, what are we going to go back? You know, and so you can see that engagement and that excitement that's happening on their faces. Yes, and lots of games with math and, and lots of activities. And, and my seniors like the uh, the quiz show because <laughs> they just do. Yes. Okay, Jonathan, here's some you want to talk about in middle grades. Yeah, everybody likes the game show. I want to say that the game show is awesome. I feel like it doesn't matter yeah. with second graders. We've done it with high school kids. So it's it's all around the board. Um, so we we did mention a lot how there's so many great pre-made activities. There's so many great pre-made game-based activities. Um, but I also think that teachers are creators. And a lot of us, you know, there's an art to teaching. And we put our own style and our own flair in it. So um, some of the things that uh, I have here for game-based learning are just that you do have a lot of opportunities as a teacher. If you do feel slightly ambitious and you want to create and stylize something yourself, you, you absolutely can. Um, so, you know, even just going through uh, a Lumio slideshow that has different activities in it, that can be a game in itself where students are, you know, tasked to complete certain ones. And then you can select a random slide that maybe they completed. Uh, some of the slides that we have here, this was um, uh, an activity I did with uh, Ms. Wilson, one of our seventh grade ELA teachers. Um, and we essentially use a combination of shadow it out some graphic organizers to help students uh, essentially come up with just a good solid paragraph using different sentence types. Um, but ultimately, like it was all turned into a game. So I would just encourage too that, you know, feel free to get creative with how you use Lumio, um, because you can turn anything into a game with it as well. And the kids have so much fun. So uh, I think you wanted to talk about this one too, huh? Um, yeah, and again, this is just another, uh, this is like a fill in kind of um, blank. So I, I don't know if you'd even call it as much of a game, but it's still the idea that, you know, we were looking at coordinate planes here, looking at vocabulary. Um, and it's game like in the sense that students have to choose the correct answer, they put it in, if it doesn't work, it kind of spits it back out. Uh, there's a lot of matching games that are in Lumio as well, that does this. And, and I think it's just the fact that it's, it's also drag and drop. And it's, it's that immediate feedback that once the students complete the game, they complete the level and they can move on to another slide, especially if they're in a student paced mode. Okay, let's talk a little high school, Bethany. So just like my K, um, K through two and three through eight kids get so, students get so excited about these games, y'all, the high school, you would think that it's like cheesy, the kids are not gonna get into it, but y'all, they love it. They probably love it more than the K two and three through five students do. And so it's so funny to go into a classroom and see these high school students playing these games because they get so into it. And so, the beautiful part about these games is like some of the ones that we work with teachers, um, we would come in and they would be like, are we playing a game today? Are we playing a game today? And we just take their content and put it into these games. And so the kids were like, 
can we do it in a game form? And they were so excited and they get so competitive and wanted to race against each other. And so it's just a beautiful thing that I love seeing high school students get so pumped and engaged in their learning. Can we just stay on this slide for half a second? Because yeah. Bethany, I feel like as a, you know, my background is more in secondary, although I'm K to 12 now. And I just, I, I love looking at the content on this, on these slides, because, you know, we can see in a second grade classroom, if we're just talking like basic math facts, or we're talking about things like that. But I I've, I've see your, you know, Capulet and Montague references here in Warsaw Pact NATO, and, you know, the, the math and the organelles and function, like, it's like, Yes, you can take these templates and and it can scale. And that's what's beautiful about Lumio too, is that, you know, all of these game-based, all of the templates, like it doesn't matter what grade you teach, you can use them effectively. So very They're cool. all customizable. Mm -hmm. We have all these great questions coming through. I think we're about ready to get away. We've already given away one to Janet and I think we've got another one. I'm waiting on Casey to uh, let us know that we're about to give away. So really good uh, questions. And I think the fact that don't let it, don't let it deceive you. These are actually pretty hard questions, right? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay. A little bit more high school here, Bethany. So when Lumio Smart, they rolled this out, I was so excited because I was like, oh, I cannot wait because I heard it was coming. And then when it came, I was like, yes, because teachers have been asking for this. And so in the match and mob and the sort of activities, the game based activities, you can actually see the class results. You can see how many students are getting it incorrect. And it's just that really quick data that I can say, okay, I need to go back over this topic with my kids. Um, but I love the, the other thing that I love about this too, is it breaks it down by student. So I can see how many they're getting wrong, how many they're getting correct, and what I need to do specifically for that student to pull them into a group, maybe by themselves or with other students, so that I can see what's going on with them and how I can support them. Okay, so now we're talking about connecting with students socially and emotionally, and you've kind of hinted at this before, um, Bethany, but let's let's talk about this because even though we've returned to in-person, this is so important. Yes, so um, we were using a lot of these at the beginning of the, um, at the beginning of the pandemic, we really started this in talking to kids and then the pandemic happened and the, you know, it was, you know, how are you feeling today? And these came in so much. Well, we started integrating this more with like PBIS and leader in um, me at our schools in our district. And so really connecting to those students and seeing how they were feeling when they came into class in the morning. And it was great because it wasn't just K through two, it was going into high school too and having conversations just to have those check-ins with students just to see how they were doing. And I love that SMART already has these pre-made templates again, right? all these pre-made templates created that I can just pull right on the fly. I don't have to go out and create my own, but you can see in like one of the top ones, we had some, um, I think it was like ninth graders the other day, they were pulling the little pen drop and saying where they were, how they were doing. So that teacher went over, was able to have a private conversation with them to see how, you know, what was wrong, you know, what ha was happening at home. And so she knew how far she could push that student that day and like when she needed to love on that student. So I absolutely adore these. And just understanding where students are and they kind of communicate and understand emojis, don't they? Yes, definitely. They do for sure. Okay, so we're gonna talk about data notebooks. So Bethany, what's a data notebook? So a data notebook, uh, we started these, let me tell you when we started these, just give you a background information. So we started these probably about um, 2016, 2015. feels like, um, it doesn't feel like that long ago, but, and it was all paper. And so I remember with these binders, my kids would come and like the papers would be falling out and like somebody lost a page. And it was really good. We were trying to get the kids to track their attendance. Like, are they coming to school every day? Um, and we know how much that is important for our students. And then looking at where they're at in their learning, you know, what they need to do to increase their reading levels or in their math levels. And so what we did was really took all of that paper stop killing all these trees with all these papers for this data notebook sheets and put it into Lumio, which was fantastic. And so you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, every morning the students come in, they check their attendance. 
um, at one of the schools in um, Bibb County at Rosa Taylor. They're checking their attendance. They put a little check mark icon or they can do you know, the pen tool or type in it and put here. Um, this one student, she uses the check mark and she goes and does it every morning. And so when they have student data conferences, they can pull these up with their parents, parents um, and, or guardians and talk to them about what they're learning and how it's going and sit there and have that true, like really great conversation to say, this is where I'm at, this is what I need to do and how I'm gonna do it. Excellent. And, and I love that they're setting their own goals yes. and they're just doing all those um, types of things and you can look and see that progress. Uh, so Jonathan, the ability to jump between multiple lesson modalities. So this was asked about earlier when somebody who said, Hey, I don't have one-to-one -one devices. What can I do? Let's talk about that. I mean, so this might rank up there with probably one of my favorite features in Lumio. Um, but uh, we won't mention any other products by name, but but some products that uh, wind up having the teacher move the class along uh, don't offer much flexibility in terms of after you create the lesson, if you realize when you get to a slide that something's wrong or you need to change something, or maybe even somebody brings something up in the class, which happens often if a student, you know, maybe the understanding isn't clear and you realize I have to pivot here. I have to make sure that my students understand this concept before we can, you know, effectively move on. Uh, the thing that's awesome about Lumio is that uh, at any point, you know, you can set it up so that you are running the show as the teacher, that you are pulling the students along slide by slide. And then you might have a 10 minute window where you say, all right, I'm switching it over now and I'm giving you all control. And for the next 10 slides, your goal is to, you know, advance as far as you can advance. So if you feel like you get to slide three and there's a concept there that, that's giving you some trouble, you can continue to practice that one over and over. If you feel like you understand this concept, you can advance. So it's like self-guided differentiation for the students. They're able to work through that. Um, you can set up slides to be individual and then you can make them collaborative. When we say collaborative, we mean students Students can work in teams, they can partner up. Uh, it could even be a full class collaboration, which I absolutely love. And there's times that, you know, the teacher might like we might do a full class collaborative slide and I might realize, man, half the class is not getting this here. Uh, so I can quickly jump in. I can I can edit it so that we can say, you know what, we're going to do with some individual practice or maybe I'm going to put you in smaller groups and you can do that all on the fly. Um, it's pretty awesome how that works out where you can kind of personalize learning this way. And I'll jump in really quick, just talk about that power personalized learning. So I love the fact that I can give them that student link. So if they need to practice, you know, if they need to learn more about, you know, the Montague's or if they need to know more about the Capulets, I can give it to them. Or if they need more phonemic awareness and letter sounds, I can give them a link. They can click on that link, log in, and they can go at that lesson at their own pace rather than us sitting in a classroom and like going through it as a whole group, I can really personalize the experience for them. Tim, so Tim just asked, so you can edit your lessons while giving the lesson. Yeah. So the one thing I, I will say with that, because Tim, I was about to respond to you there. Um, the, yeah, the beauty of this now, while you're editing, it does, if you're in teacher mode, it'll put the students on just a quick, Hey, hold up five seconds. Your teacher's adjusting something. Um, but I mean, you're talking like 30 seconds of adjustment time sometimes. Uh, and even just to tell the students, pause one sec, we're going to quick switch this up and pivot. Uh, I think that's good teaching if you realize that that's something that needs to be done. Uh, he also asked, is there a limit to the number of students in a quote class? I don't know what the limit is, but, uh, you know, I mean, typically we're not teaching it. hundreds. <laughs> I've never exceeded it either. There, yeah, there's, uh, I have, we've had 200 and 300 people in our lessons without issues. So I haven't broken it yet. <laughs> um, so you can have a, a big group for sure. Yeah. Okay. So uh, editing lessons on the fly, which we've kind of been talking about, but uh, you want to talk about that again, Jonathan? Yeah, so, you know, going along with the personalized learning, going between the student collaboration, things like that, I, you know, ultimately, the point of this is that, yes, if you're in the middle of a lesson, and you realize that whether you've made the mistake as the teacher, because you put something or you forgot something, or you just realize that the lesson's moving in another direction, um, which again, I think is just good teaching sometimes, uh, while you're in that lesson, it's just such a simple go up to the top hamburger menu, click on edit lesson, 
It'll take you from presentation mode to the edit mode. And in there, you can easily move slides or you can adjust them so that, you know, you're changing it from a student pace to a collaborative pace. Or if you just even want to say, you know what, we need some more uh, formative assessments or game-based activities. I'm going to throw two more in here really quick that I already have. Uh, and you can do it in, in no time at all. Um, but super easy interface, really easy to make it happen. Uh, while See, you're in I, I like that you don't have to like kick them out, edit restart it give them a new code and make them join again like that that part is gone which is some of the other tools i've used that is kind of a pain it's yeah, all about the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. saving time and i know our first slide our first uh, point was just easy to create lessons it's it's just as easy to edit lessons as well it's not something that you know you're going to look at and be like oh this is going to take me 10 minutes it's going to be like give me 60 seconds and i can adjust yeah. as needed yeah and, and Janet's asking a question we're going to get to here in just a minute, Bethany. Can you record directions for students to listen to? Uh, what timing? And she didn't even know what the next slide was, huh, Bethany? Here you go. Right? Yeah. So, Janet, just to answer your question, yes, yes, and yes. So, I remember teaching kindergarten in first grade, and y'all, it was a struggle sometimes in stations, and I would tell them how to play a new game or do a new activity, and then we were like, they would go to it and we had done it probably y'all it, it felt like 50 times and they would go to that station they're like what what are what are we supposed to do again and i was like and i would go over there and tell them explain it again and then you know like 20 minutes later i forgot <laughs> you know because they only you know they only get two or three steps at a time a lot of them sometimes those kindergartners and first graders and so the beautiful part about it is that you could record directions now and give your student they can click on it and so you don't have to keep repeating yourself it saves you time on your end saves you time in your voice and on your nerves all right and pull from pulling out your hair having to repeat that over and over and over again and so i love that piece of it and then the other thing that is new that is just fantastic if you haven't experienced the immersive reader it is amazing. Any student that has trouble with reading um, and understanding what you want them to do, you can type in those texts on that slide and make sure you have your immersive reader turned on and it will read the text to the students. And I love that. Um, it's just a fantastic, fantastic platform. And I'm so glad that was embedded into Lumio. Yeah, immersive reader is one of those extensions that uh, I think the first few weeks of school we we pretty much went around to sixth grade through twelfth grade and made sure every student you know would would add the extension to their their Google uh, you know their Google account pretty much because we just said this is a tool for everybody. Uh, there are so many benefits to it, so so kudos to uh, Lumio for making sure that they had that in there as well because immersive reader is an absolutely essential tool in my opinion uh, for anything like this to support students. Okay, Bethany, let's talk student agency. Yes, so I love the ability that students can add pictures, they can add images in, they can put their text, they can get really creative with um, just on a blank page. I think that was mentioned earlier, but as well as you can give them templates, like give them that background and they can fill it in. So you're gonna see right here, there's a picture of a student in the left-hand corner of this blue picture or right-hand corner of this blue picture. This student was not the type of student to get up in front of others. Um, it was a um, special ed student and his mother cried the day that his teacher sent him this picture, sent her this picture because he never did anything like that before. And so he was so excited to share his work with um, his classmates that day and what he had created. And so this to me hits me in the fills and it speaks volumes for Lumio because it gave a voice for that student and they had the ability to choose how they wanted to do it, type their text in and what they wanted to write about. And it was just amazing to see this um, little boy come out of his shell just to talk and share his knowledge with others. Um, definitely hit me in the fills. It really creates that student agency. It's really empowering them to take control of their learning and build in their learning. The next picture down at the bottom, you're gonna see some uh, fourth grade students and maybe fifth grade students. We were working on the Bill of Rights 
And so the students were going through and learning all about their the Bill of Rights and they were having to draw pictures to explain it. And so it was great to see these kids have their imagination, you know, that creativity piece come in. They started drawing all kinds of pictures, pulling some people were pulling pictures in from images. And then I had some, they were like, can we can we do other things to it too? Can I upload a video? They were wanting to like create their own presentation um, to explain the Bill of Rights. So that was super fantastic. Just giving them that voice and empowering them as learners to share their learning and show us what they know. Oh, Vicki, you're on mute. Yep. I love it because um, when you're able to look at all of the students' work, you're able to kind of pull that student out. So instead of putting them on the spot, you already know that you're setting them up to win. And you say, hey, I, I see that that so-and-so has done this amazing work. Would you like to share? And you're coming from a place of positivity and not a threat. You know, it's just so great. I agree completely. Okay, so we're about to kind of have a little bit of a super share here. We've shared lots of ideas, but Jonathan, you just tell me when to click. We've got lots of really cool ideas. We have, I think, one more license to give away in this session. So Casey is giving away that license and taking a look, and we'll go through these. So let's go, Jonathan. Yeah, so we could probably spend an hour just, just sharing ideas, but we just wanted to touch on a few of the uh, ways that we've used Lumio. And again, just to emphasize the point that it doesn't matter what grade or what content you teach, you can use Lumio. Um, so just some examples we had here. This is from a, a sixth grade classroom uh, looking at, um, you know, uh, plot points um, and essentially, you know, taking a PDF, something that we already had, scanning it. Uh, you know, uploading it to Lumio and then immediately making those manipulatives so students could plot points. And then we use this great, you know, built-in tool that Lumio already had uh, where we've got, you know, our, our music scales here and students essentially got to write songs about what they learned involving these plot points. Uh, and then we were able to pull up like a little keyboard on um, uh, just on Google and then students would come up and they would, they would play their song and sing kind of uh, what they learned about plot points. So again, it's just that idea of like being creative, how you use it. There's so many ready-made resources. Um, so that, that's just one example right here that we have. Uh, you can go to the next slide there, Vicki. Um, and again, this is still part of that same lesson. We're looking at coordinate planes, um, be, but being able to build in these different activities. So before we get to where we actually do the plot points, we're making sure our vocabulary is good. Uh, we're making sure that we understand all the concepts here. Um, and again, more interactive. This is a collaborative sheet where students are able to go in and kind of just type in their responses. And as we mentioned on the last slide, that ability to preview students' work and be able to see okay, this student completely has it or this group has it. Uh, and then to say to the class, hey, I would love to show, you know, Billy and Jenna's example here because it's just amazing. Are you guys cool with that? They say yes. And then you could put it up there. And then you're just really, you know, offering some encouragement and reinforcing the fact that students can feel confident and they understand the concept. So uh, just a great way to go about it. Uh, so some this is this is looks like classic middle school to me right here. Uh, just an awesome uh, figurative language activity that we had um, students. This is a way I mean, it looks kind of silly. It looks scary. It looks crazy. It looks all over the place. Um, but this was actually part of a, a, you know, a multiple day writing assignment where students essentially were were creating uh, where I'm from poems about their own life. Uh, sometimes that would get personal. Uh, there, we have a sample life map here that was a Lumio graphic organizer that was essentially built. Um, and then students were able to just use the insert image feature from Lumio as a place to brainstorm. Uh, we kept this individual because some students here, you know, they had images like divorce. They had images about families that maybe passed away. Uh, they had things that they liked, things that they, you know, dream about, that they're afraid about, but uh, just a great brainstorming place for them to go. Um, you know, we did look at singular and plural uh, terms. Uh, we did do the quiz game. And then uh, my my good friend, Mr. Walter, an eighth or a seventh grade science teacher, um, we just had, you know, again, we talked about those personal touch points. Uh, and it was the idea of like, what was fun today? What did we what did we have a good laugh about? Uh, and, you know, students just were mercilessly wonderful about the funniest things from the lesson. But, you know, again, this is ultimately the, the goal here is for students to write, you know, something, something hopefully beautiful that, that's utilizing the correct grammar, understanding our figurative language here. Uh, but we're doing it as a community and all of these slides together are able to kind of make that work. So again, for a middle school assignment, I think, I think it was awesome. Um, 
So just a couple other ones here. So I, I actually, I'm, the first, uh, there was a picture on the left. Um, this was a whole uh, kind of like role-playing scenario where uh, we had the students envision that the teacher, Miss um, Wilson here was being hunted by, I think Dog the Bounty Hunter at this point. Um, and uh, they, they essentially had to work through almost like an escape room in order to save her. Um, again, we're, we were focusing on paragraph structure, but turning it into kind of a game using some of Lumio's templates, uh, having them look at different uh, grammatical structures and sentence structures as they completed this challenge. Um, the, the bottom middle picture, the shout it out, I love the shout it out feature, um, but there's some really cool and fun ways that you can use it besides just saying, hey, how's everybody doing today? Uh, in this case, we were just doing an alliteration challenge where we had four columns uh, of different letters and students could essentially be assigned a team of a letter and then they had like two minutes to furiously write as many sentences as they could with those different letter types to showcase how they understand alliteration and we just had this giant wall of hilarious sentences uh it is a 60 second activity but it's again great example of formative uh assessment there and just to be able to provide students feedback like what was your favorite sentence which one used you know the best examples of alliteration there um and again, uh, I think you can see on the bottom right, that little, that graph that's filling up. Uh, these are just some of those response questions from, from Lumio that are awesome. They're pre-made. You know, you might have a slide or two where you're talking about a concept. You pop one of those in. You can get a quick 30 second look at how many people get this. And if they don't get it, okay, let's go back. Let's go again. If they get it, all right, everybody's got it. Let's move on. Uh, so really great opportunity. And then I think that picture in the upper right, uh, Lumio hooked us up with some, some great socks. So that uh, the magical socks, as we call them at our school, students are see me in the hallway and they usually say like, do you have any of those socks? And I may tell them that that helps uh, whoever you have the pair of socks, you give one to the person that you care about. And someday you will go to prom with that person, no matter what. I don't know yeah. if Lumio can technically vouch for that, but I've been telling everybody that. So yeah, I hope that works Excellent. out for them. Awesome. Okay. Let's look at a few more. Um, so I think this was on one of the earlier slides, but again, just uh, all grade levels talking about that, um, you know, immediate feedback, whether we have the uh, the infinite cloner being used for students to practice their writing. Uh, we have just a, a basic graphic organizer where students can practice addition. Uh, and this is something the teacher has you know, the ability to assign if they want students working in groups, if they want students working individually, we can pull up their slides immediately while they're working, provide that immediate feedback. And then we see on the bottom left, that's another, uh, you know, game-based um, uh, activity right there that the game will automatically uh, essentially tell the students if they're on track or not. Yeah, and again, I mean, text more. features here. This is, uh, I know we have so many here. I, we talk about these forever. Um, but again, this is just a teacher made creation, essentially just taking, you know, a worksheet and scanning it and then a, like just popping in a couple text boxes and turning on, hey, it's a manipulative. You can drag and drop here. And when you're done, you can move on to the next slide. So it's so easy to take something you already have that maybe you would do. Uh, as a class and maybe not individually and be able to just quick turn it into an interactive for a student uh, that they could just make sure that they're good to go, call in some students and project their work up on the board. Uh, or you could do this as a whole class and invite students to come up and do it themselves. So there's a lot of different ways you can use these. And see instantly that it's done as you move on instead of just assuming and then going, okay, how did you get through the whole class with all this stuff blank? Like you actually know what people are doing. Yep, absolutely. Okay. This is cool. Yeah, so um, just another example. This was uh, one of our game-based ones here, nonfiction text features, uh, able to just have students go through it. And again, just this is one slide of probably 20 that we had on this one, and students can go at their own pace. It might be something that we don't even say you have to find them all, but even to say you might you might even be turned with a partner, look at some of these after you find one, turn to your partner and, and explain to them why this is a nonfiction text feature. Uh, so again, using those good teaching strategies in there while you're still going through the, uh, the Lumio presentations okay Josie, oh Josie asked a question she said do Go you ahead. need to create separate files for each student or does Lumia do it for you yeah that's it's the beauty. magic yeah. it does it for you yeah if you're a Google Classroom user I don't I know our school we're, we're Google and we're Mac but uh, in Google Classroom there's a really awesome feature that kind of revolutionized that which was make a copy for all students when you select that Lumio has kind of the same deal here where once they join your class if I make an assignment in there I can immediately just one click turn it to an individual handout and now it's distributed to every single person in my Lumio session it's amazing and then as a teacher view 
I can click on teacher view and I'll see every single student's name. And if I click on that student's name, it pops up on my screen. And then if I want to project that, I can. If I want to leave comments on it, I can. It's pretty remarkable. Yeah. And you can give them the student link too. And they mm -hmm. can have the student link so they can get on it on the on their own. Absolutely. Okay. Um, so just oh sorry, go ahead. I'm waiting for you. <laughs> so yeah, the, the, we're moving back here to uh, some of our primary grades, but then I think I also have some middle school next to that as well. Um, you know, doing just even basic math skills is something that, that was really fun to do in Lumio. Um, we would, you know, have, like we just kind of talked about, individually assign each of the students these images. There's a drawing tool and a text tool that's available for students. So we might say, all right, I want you to find these, like the, the tree that is north of the lake or the pond. So even just talking, you know, directions, students would go on their screens, they could circle that. Uh, and then we would give them another direction and they would kind of be able to work at their own pace. We would then move this to like a full class session. So all, you know, 24 kids could be looking and say, okay, everybody right now circle the uh, tree that's east of the lake. And then you would just see all the circles popular on the screen. It's like, oh, everybody gets it. That's great. Um, and then same thing, you know, looking at the middle school, I think, you know, even just some of the the, the higher level, like, you know, we're, if we're looking at uh, geography here, uh, go on your map and mark it with a star, mark it with an X. Students can do that. And again, if you want to do that individually, collaboratively, uh, you can make that happen. So uh, Tim asked, is the word search a template in Lumio? Sure is. <laughs> Bethany, you're uh, muted. You look like you had something great to say. Go ahead. I did. I was really excited. <laughs> I was like trying to type it as fast as I could. Um, yeah, so it's actually, Tim, it's actually a smart lab, like a smart game. And you just go in there and put in the words and choose your background, change it up. Um, and the kids, and it, it, it creates it for you and just give it to the kids and they can go through and fill it out. So I love that piece. Um, the words are, they're great. Very cool. Okay, um, let's look. We have one or two more, I think. Yeah, so this was, um, so we're looking at some K to two action here, uh, discussing place values. Um, again, essentially, this was, this was basically created from scratch, but this is something that, um, or actually, I take that back, the, the columns here, I think, were actually the only thing from the PDF that were added, and then popping it in Lumio, just able to make those bullet points of here's what I want you to show, um, you know, 2003 times, uh, basically taking those buttons, just popped in those images, clicked on Infinite Cloner. Now students can drag and move those across using the pen tool to write over, you know, exactly what the number is. Um, the creation time is so minimal, but the action that you're getting from the students is huge. And it's a, it's a worksheet that you could essentially copy 10 times and have different challenges and students can work through at their own pace. You can share it out. Um, it's, it's pretty awesome. And then I think in the bottom right, just as some reinforcement between each of those worksheets, uh, you know, this one here, this is one of our uh, quiz games, which the kids absolutely love. It, it randomly can put them on different teams. Students answers questions. Uh, I think they earn different crystals and things like that as they're going. Um, but again, just, just kind of like putting and embedding all of these different activities, just constantly reinforcing these different concepts in different ways, but the kids are involved every single time. Love it. Okay. One more. I put a lot in here. I'm sorry. There's so much. So um, yeah, like the top one there, this is, we're looking at middle school right here. And I think we have, um, you know, even that metaphor simile, there are so many awesome graphic organizers that are ready to go yes. for you. You just need to put in the labels. So I don't care what you're teaching. In this case, it was, you know, I've got a two column chart or I've got a Venn diagram. Uh, and in this case, we basically had students work in teams to complete a bunch of various figurative language uh, exercises that reinforced uh, different, you know, figurative language in, in ELA. Uh, and this one here, we have metaphors versus similes. So groups had, you know, two minutes, create, you know, as many metaphors and similes, one partner pick one, one pick the other, and then switch. There's some fill in the blank activities. And then of course the game based uh, where as students match terms with definitions, you know, the knight fights the dragon. Uh, if he does it right, he's blocking them with the shield. And, you know, eventually you can win if you get them all right there. So um, yeah, just a, just a really large awesome. variety of different exercises to reinforce concepts. And I think that we're going to have to kind of skip uh well, is, do we have one more? Is this our last one? Yep, that's our last one. Let's talk about this one. And then we're going to answer, uh, Bethany, if you'll look at Josie's question, we'll see if you can answer that one. Go ahead, Jonathan. Sure. So this is just, um, this was a, an activity we put together for the hundredth day of school. I don't know if other schools celebrate the hundredth day uh, as well like this, but you know, we do a, a lot of activities for it. So um, this one here was just, a, it was a variety of exercises, but I think they're 
They're all really good examples of how you can use Lumio because one, we have a game-based activity that's essentially a match and flip where students had to match the actual number with base 10 blocks. Uh, that's pretty much made for you in Lumio. You can just put in the content, which we just threw in the images and numbers. Uh, the bottom right, I really like this one. This is just a, a number chart from one to 100. So our kindergartners could grab all those little uh, those little pads of numbers on the side and they could just drag those in. Um, and then as a teacher, you can just get quick looks at did were they able to successfully create all of those numbers there. Um, we also switched it at one point to collaborative where we said, how quick will it take us all to everyone just grab a number and try to move it in? Um, I think we did it with like a gumball machine as well. And it's really fun to see the kids all work at the same time. Uh, and then you can see we have our, our shapes there filling in, you know, that hundred column and, and students can do that. They can resize. Uh, it's, it's, it's pretty neat. So just a bunch of different activities there. You could see it's, it's, it's K to 12 ready. So Josie asked, uh, I only have six Chromebooks to share with a class of 28. Do you need to log out each time a new student user comes uh, or can they just enter the code with their name? Bethany, do you know that answer? Yeah, so she can still run that. So there's two There's two answers to this. So you could run the lesson and the students could go, one group of students could go into the lesson and then you know sign in with the code. And then when they finish, they could leave the lesson like to go to another station. And then the new group would come in, they would sign in, use the um, use same code. It, usually if you have them on the same computer every time, their name will pop up um, to make it a little bit easier for you. Um, the other thing you can do is give them the link, right? So give them the student link and then they can go click on the student link and sign in, you know, either Google or Microsoft and get right in and have it at their own pace. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you. Okay, bell to bell, you know how it is. So we are going to uh, wrap up. Goodbye, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thanks for listening.